You're listening to A Book With Legs, a podcast presented by Smead Capital Management. At Smead Capital Management, we advise investors who fear stock market failure. You can learn more at SmeadCap.com or by calling your financial advisor. Welcome to A Book With Legs podcast. I'm Cole Smead. I'm the CEO and a portfolio manager here at Smead Capital Management. At our firm, we are readers and book junkies. It can be said that leaders are readers, and we believe books provide us a great source of information for filtering what is and isn't important for us as investors. Investing is the last great liberal art and the best way to spend a lifetime of learning. This podcast is for readers, thinkers, business-minded people, and investors who want to grow their knowledge from great authors and their writing. Charlie Munger often talks about using multiple mental models and analysis. Our aim for this podcast is to help listeners test Munger's theory in business, markets, and people. Does it matter when you pay with cash, card, iPhone, or Bitcoin? We will delve into this with Brett Scott to talk about his book, Cloud Money, Cash, Cards, Crypto, and the War for Our Wallets. Um, a little background on Brett. Brett is an economic anthropologist, financial activist, and former broker. In 2013, he published The Heretic's Guide to Global Finance, Hacking the Future of Money. Since then, has spoken at hundreds of events around the globe and has appeared across international media, including BBC and Sky News. He has written extensively on financial reform, digital finance, alternative currency, blockchain technology, and the cashless society for various publications. Uh, he's also published the Altered States of Monetary Consciousness newsletter. He has worked on financial reform campaigns and alternative currency systems with a wide range of groups and is a senior fellow of the Finance Innovation Lab in the UK. He is joining us today from Berlin. Um, Brett, it'll be fun to think about the use of cash versus credit and chips today. I'm glad to have you on the podcast and glad you could join. Great to be here, Cole. Thanks for getting me on. So to kind of start us out, teach us why you wrote Cloud Money. What inspired you to kind of go at this subject in the way you did? Sure, yeah, there's a few a few uh, reasons. Um, primary among them, I'd say, is that in 2013, I published a book called The Heretic's Guide to Global Finance, and uh, which kind of came out of my experiences. I worked in over-the-counter derivatives, OTC derivatives, mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, but I also had a kind of political background. So I was interested in writing a book that would help people in civil society, just like ordinary people um, who weren't finance experts. Would, I was interested in creating a book that would help them understand the financial sector, but also sure. to think about how you kind of um, sort of challenge the financial sector and build alternative forms. And so that was came out in 2013. And I noticed at that time, um, it was, you know, just after the sort of financial crisis and there was still a lot of the kind of uh, maybe like anti-bank or anti-financial sector sentiment around. The Occupy Wall Street movements had been occurring and all this kind of stuff. Um, but at that time, a lot of the big tech firms were still considered to be basically good, mm -hmm. right? It was, still, it was still the kind of like don't do evil um, mantra of Google, per yeah. Period of Google's history, right? Yeah. And, um, and a lot of the tech firms were kind of trading upon this idea that they represented a kind of new world of positive innovation, whereas you know, that, that, that could contrast with the kind of stagnant, you know, corruption of the banking sector, right? And um, in London, where I was, there was the fintech, the fintech sector, so financial technology sector is very big, right? And a lot of the fintech firms were trading on that as well. Right, so they were, had this idea that what they were doing is going to revolutionize finance by kind of updating it and so on. And um, I basically became aware that a lot of the fintech rhetoric was basically not really about revolutionizing finance. It was really about just automating finance. And those are two different things. You know? Sure. In the history of capitalism, stuff gets automated all the time, right? It's not particularly revolutionary. It's quite normal, actually. Um, so the fintech sector was really just automating standard finance, trying to make it faster, um, and yet was sort of cloaking it in a kind of revolutionary rhetoric. And so cloud money partly comes out of you know, me being exposed to that a lot, because at the time when I, I put my first book out, there was a lot of this kind of like, a lot of the people in the tech sector thought of themselves as being kind of like the type of person I was speaking about in the book, or in terms of like, you know, building alternative systems. Sure. All right. And so 
Yeah, and so I mean, cloud money is really at, at a meta level has been looking at how actually you know big tech and big finance really are kind of symbiotic, sure, rather than rather than in some kind of competition with each other. Um, and then you know another sort of aspect, and I'll, I'll sort of try to keep this short. But I also come from an economic anthropology background. Economic anthropology tends to have a much stronger grasp of money than economics does, um, because a lot of economic anthropology was involved, you know, going into non-capitalist and non-Western societies and looking at how they actually did, you know, economic life. Whereas lots of economics basically sort of took a capitalist money system for granted and generate all this sort of mythology around money from that. So economics has tended to be very uncritical and quite unimaginative when it comes to thinking about money, whereas the sort of anthropology tradition has a much richer tradition. Um, and I started to notice that the way people were describing stuff like cashless society was totally inaccurate and also quite um, plagued with all sorts of mythology. So cloud money kind of like looks at that a lot as well, looking at how the sort of automation of finance is... Um, you know, leading to the sort of demonization of a cash system, um, which I guess we'll go into, uh, but that the public frequently is ill-equipped to understand what's happening because they're using these kind of very sort of flawed models of understanding money. Well, yeah, to your point, I mean, when I think of fintech, I actually don't even think of the term much in a U.S. context because even though it's used, I feel like that became like the ultimate buzzword in London post-2009. It's kind of like, Bankers are bad. Fintech is good. We're the savior. We're the revolution. Um, but it really was just to your point, it was kind of like a it was London's reply to bad banking in effect. Right. It was the it was the, their outlet. It's partly also because bear in mind, the U.S. is so dominant internationally um, in terms of it's by far the most powerful economy. And it also dominates the entire sort of innovation rhetoric via Silicon Valley. And if sure. you're in London, you're, the sort of startup scene is not nearly as well-funded or well-developed um, like every other country. Um, so actually, the sort of competitive advantage that startup entrepreneurs in London had was to try and you know, leave their job in banking yeah. and to try and sort of like apply a Silicon Valley style of thinking to it, which often basically involves pasting a digital interface over something. Correct. Well, and I think I think you gave a wonderful analogy. Um, I think the analogy you used, um, I think you you said it would it'd be like being Martin Luther raging against the Pope while praying to the same God and reading the same scripture. It's not as big of a departure as people would think. Yeah, I think in the I think in the the book I was maybe using that in the context of the sort of crypto world, which is a sort of secondary outspring of the sort of fintech stuff. But yeah. um, uh, maybe the, the, the metaphor that's slightly um, uh, that I use more directly in the book for a lot of the fintech world was a lot of the revolutionary rhetoric is a little bit like an iOS developer claiming that they're going to kind of overthrow Apple. Exactly. You know, this kind of thing. They, they, they're using the underlying systems of Apple to build, you know, the underlying operating systems to build apps. And it's not going to displace that system, right? And so a lot of the fintech, fintech revolutionary sort of rhetoric was all about we're going to displace the banking sector, despite the fact that they had to interface into the banking sector, didn't have banking licenses, were required to use the banking sector all the time. Sure. Um, they would sort of have this kind of like double think going on. Well, to your point, like using Robinhood as an example, Robinhood was a wonderful interface for a U.S. broker dealer, ultimately. Okay. And it, it was very fun to interface with them. It was a great app. Uh, it had all kinds of bells and whistles, et cetera. And I remember um, Robinhood was pushing to where they didn't want anyone to have, um, you know, a one day settlement on securities. They wanted to push to same day settlement. Now, the reason why they were doing that wasn't because they were trying to revolutionize the industry. It would just require less capital for them to be a broker dealer. In other words, to your point, the same rules applied with this quote unquote startup exciting fintech company. Yeah, you know, in general, I mean, and I'm not trying to say that there weren't forms of, you know, disruption going on or that there aren't forms of disruption going on. But, you know, a lot of, a lot of the time there's a bias in much of the world 
towards fixating upon change rather than looking at what stays the same, right? So mm -hmm. all the innovation press has journalists constantly trying to sort of tell you what's new and so on, right? That they don't really have any incentive to tell you what stays the same. And by and large, a lot of the stuff stays the same, right? So, you know, that, and that's it. So, so that we have this kind of problem in our sort of storytelling in society. Um, but, you know, in, you know, occasionally there's sort of some relative rearrangements of power to some extent in these big systems. But on average, they kind of stay the same, right? So, um, you know, Robin Hood sort of disrupts some kind of aspect of the sort of surface appearance of the system and yet replicates many of the same principles. Sure. Well, to your, to your point, I mean, you, you point out, and this is, I think, in your introduction, you talked about the 1984 Apple Super Bowl commercial, which is, you know, viewed to be to this day, you know, kind of like a revolutionary advertising campaign. It was really kind of like fighting against the power structure and systems that were at that time. You know, think of like IBM, for example. It was a, it was saying we're not going to be IBM, okay? But isn't Apple now part of that power structure? And therefore, to your point, what was revolutionary in 1984 is now, you know, not today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in any any sort of historian of capitalism could point to a thousand other examples of exactly the same process repeating itself, like basically on autopilot, right? Um, every single industry that's sort of semi-new claims to be engaging in a revolution, then they become an incumbent, and then they become the target of next the next wave of people who are claimed to be launching a revolution. Sure. Right? It's It gets pretty boring after a while once you start to sort of see it. Um, you know, albeit, you know, I'm imagining in sort of your role with sort of stock advisory and that kind of stuff, you know, part of your sort of job, and, I'm, and I don't actually, I don't presume to know all of your job, but, you know, would be to some extent to sort of try and pick out which of those might actually sort of create some kind of disruption versus those that will sort of just fizzle away, you know. So, you know, there is, there is interesting dynamism happening, but when you take a sort of step back and look deeply, often it's a lot, um, it's quite predictable, over time. Yeah, I completely agree. And also, I think I think the other thing you do a really good job in this book is you talk about the different incentive structures of the different parties, like to your point, and we'll get into this more later, but the government has a different incentive than the banks do and the credit card companies do and, and these technology companies do. They all have different incentives and, and different interests. One of the things I don't want to skip over, though, um, Brett, is... Can you teach our listeners about your background, your upbringing? Because I found this very interesting, um, you know, lens for you know you to take your readers through in in your view of the world. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in South Africa um, at the sort of the tail end of the apartheid regime. Um, I don't know how much your listeners know about the apartheid regime, but basically, it was um, if I was being blunt, it was a fascist police state a police state that basically like was authoritarian, right? Like, uh, and that's what I grew up in. Um, and, you know, apartheid kind of had all these sort of hard coded uh, legal policies of, you know, uh, racism basically, which were often designed to like enrich various business owners. All right. So you sort of just force cheap labor to work in the mines for like various like big business owners. So sure. that was my kind of background as a sort of white South African. And if you're a white South African, you're taught that you're supposed to like support that. Um, but I was always a bit of an outsider. Um, so I naturally developed a sort of distrust for um, kind of conventional thinking because I was surrounded by a very uncritical acceptance sure. of the status quo. Um, but you know, rather than maybe facing that in, in South Africa, I kind of like projected it internationally and started to look at, you know, the big structures of power internationally, you know, um, to the whole global financial system and so on. So, but, um, yeah. you know, my dad's like a military guy. Uh, so, you know, I have experience of the kind of world of like mercenaries and all this kind of stuff, you know, this is quite common in Southern Africa. <laughs> um, but it's, yeah, you know, I'm like... Um, it also kind of the South African background gives me quite a lot of experience of like maybe non-Western ways of seeing economies as well. Sure. I think a lot, of, a lot of people who are based in very like highly industrialized kind of capitalist societies and stuff don't realize that there's 
whole sections of the world that don't really operate on those principles. You know, there's whole what? sections of South Africa that actually are only partially integrated into markets. To, to your point, I think I think you explained as an example. I mean, just having reliable power is a unique thing in some of those parts of the world versus to your point in a Western context, you would never think about that. Yeah, infrastructure. And this is a huge part of the world, right? I mean, we're talking about like more than 50% of the world's population doesn't have all these like things that many people in big, you know, Western cities take for granted. Sure. So a lot of the kind of like rhetoric of, you know, for example, endless digitization, which is a sort of standard part of mainstream rhetoric right now, doesn't really make sense once you sort of leave certain places like in the big cities. Sure. Um, and yet that's such an incredibly prevalent ideology because overall, the overall global economy is dominated by particular players who have mm -hmm. that agenda, right? So regardless of whether the agenda is realistic you know, in the future, right now, doesn't matter. You know, the the belief system will get sort of forced down everyone's throats, regardless. Sure. No, and I totally. So I'm going to ask you uh, a question. I want to come back to that, but I want to ask you a question in this because you have a line in your book. You say, you know, the, as you're talking about, you know, where this, you know, is pushing. You say, quote, finally, cast anyone who rebels as an irrelevant and out of touch luddite stuck in the past, who need to be cajoled along or rescued, end quote. You're presenting this in obviously like Orwellian terms. Um, you know, uh, I, I guess was Orwell right about the Luddites? Or do you look at it differently than Orwell? What did Orwell say about the, about the Luddites? Well, there was, the Luddites were the losers. I mean, they were, they were going to be left in time. And what I find remarkable about you know, uh, Orwell is that, no, the Luddites didn't win or didn't lose. They, they became the farmers with more land, right? They weren't replaced by the robots. They actually enlarged their wealth. Um, just not everybody wanted to be a farmer. Um, so I look at it in a different term, but I just wonder, do, do, you, um, do you look at this as like a winners and losers game? Do you look at it as a positive sum game? How, how do you look at the, the Luddites? It depends on where you like the scope of your vision and your kind of political ideology to some extent, right? Sure. So if you are a kind of like more conservative, free markets kind of person, like you're probably going to have a natural tendency towards believing that like attempting to hold back progress is, is like counterproductive, right? Like you're going to be like, well, in reality, what will actually happen is you'll, you know, the workers at one point feel threatened by the fact that their bosses are trying to buy machines sure. right, from other workers who built those machines. Um, and they're gonna try to use those machines to replace their labor, right? So if Correct. you're the particular laborer that's sitting there in a factory and suddenly your boss turns up one day with a bunch of new like machinery, you of course feel threatened. Now, in reality, that person's life is going to be heavily disrupted, right? But Correct. the theory, yep. at least in a kind of like sort of more positive kind of like view of like economic expansion will be, well, somehow what will happen is this person will like reskill themselves and like find a new job as like a machine operator. Sure. Right. And that's been the sort of standard line of anybody who's kind of like pro sort of like market progress. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's versions of that may or may not be true depending on the particular situations. Right. Sure. But in general, um, Part of the question, if you look at sort of, if you're more like a Marxist, right, which is kind of like more the, the sort of background that the intuitions that I have, right, is that like, well, that may be the case, but like in general, the capitalist system at some part, at some point starts to eat itself, right? There's, there's sort of limits to that process. There's limits to the amount of automation you have before you start to undermine the very structure of markets, which is what would be called, you know, in Marxist theory, the contradictions of capitalism. Mm -hmm. It's like the point in which like workers are not getting enough income to like buy the products pushed out by the, by the, the, the system. Right. Sure. Um, so for example, in Silicon Valley right now, this is the reason why they're starting to have these debates about UBI, universal basic income. They're like, Oh damn, we're like undermining the system through extreme amounts of automation. This is going to undermine the entire structure of employment in the economy, which is going to then cause like a, a drop in demand. So we better then like find a way to like prop that up through UBI. 
That's right. right. So in general, this is the kind of like thing that's going on in the background. This debate is a huge debate, right? Um, but the important point to sort of like for for like my book is that um, I'm not trying to like make some definitive answer for like who's right or wrong in that. What I point out though is that what we can definitely see is that there's a very specific ideology that's by far the most dominant in the world. Sure. Which is the idea that automation is inevitable, unstoppable, and will sort of naturally bring benefits. Okay. And that's the sort sure. of the standard ideology that you find. And right now at this particular point in time, that narrative takes the form of the digitization narrative, right? Because digitization is the main form of automation that's now going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so politically, the digital transition rhetoric is, is like completely unchallenged, all right? And when it comes to the monetary system, that rhetoric expresses itself as this anti-cash position. All right, so cash is a kind of offline, non-automated, non-digital form of money. And if you're sitting in a system that's trying to expand and automate and accelerate, it naturally will start to generate uh, certain pressures that will lead to a kind of anti-cash position, especially among the powers that be, even if ordinary people don't want that. Sure. Um, so this is a very like, long way of going. <laughs> well, no, but so there was a there was an article in the Wall Street Journal. This was like in the last I want to say is about three weeks ago. To your point, um, that uh, that was talking about people who still want to prefer to use cash, and they were interviewing these people and explaining that there is a contingent of society that still prefers to use cash all the way up to where some people are are militant about it, where they will do nothing else. Um, and it was interesting to, to, to think about because I think you discussed some of the black market activities that come out. Of it, but I think about a lot of gray things. I'll, I'll give you an example. And I and, and you could you could add on this. Um, it's like the fall of 2020. The pandemic's going on. I was we were going to take our travel trailer RV to go for a weekend to go do something. And I had a flat tire. So I get to the tire place to get the tire replaced. There's a big line, Brett. It's exactly what you don't want on a Friday when you're going to get out of town for the weekend. And so what do I do? I pull out the almighty dollar. <laughs> and I say to the guy, listen, I'll, I'll pay whatever it costs to get this fixed and tell it whoever in your service base can help me right away. I, I have a $50 bill with their name on it. Well, miraculously, Brett, it was done within 15 minutes. Okay. Now, to your point, it was outside the system, right? It never got accounted for on the books of that business. The government probably never collected taxes on it, et cetera, but it got me done what I needed done right away. So I look at those kind of things and say, there is still a premium for dollars to get things done pronto, but to your point, to do scalable transactions across the economy, there isn't. Is that a fair difference in the debate? Yeah, okay, so the, 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 the first point that like I would stress is that, and look, look, I'm always going from a kind of like meta sure. political economy kind of like perspective, right? At least that's one part of how I think. So at a meta level, if you look at the global economic system as a huge interdependent structure, all right, that's kind of a gigantic mesh. And you say, mm -hmm. okay, there are certain forces that emerge in large scale interdependent networks. Okay. That sounds kind of Maybe like a bit like abstract, but like, you know, Adam Smith would have called it the invisible hand. Right? Correct. It's like Correct. weird, strange, strange, invisible forces that seem to push on you from nowhere. You can't identify where they come from. What this basically talking about is you're stuck in a gigantic interdependent structure that you can't see. And the actions of other people are influencing you. All right. Um, and they but you can't see where it's coming from. Right now, like those types of forces, if you look at like. If you zoom out to a, a global, a global, you know, sort of uh, scale, you see they're often not really under the control of individual people, right? No individual person believes they have the power, for example, to halt the um, march of automation. All right, it's totally out of the possibility of the average person. Correct. So in, rea in reality, those forces are generated elsewhere, either by other people or often by large players that have more power relative to others in the system, right? Including governments. 
including governments, including corporates. I mean, the attack on cash has been largely corporate driven for a long time, but there are state actors involved, right? Now, if you're looking at, you know, so the automation type of stuff is sort of coming at a structural level, um, but a lot of human beings, you know, we're biological creatures. We like, we're, we're slow, you know, we like to hang out and, you know, whatever you like to do, sit by a fire, like smoke weed or like, I, I don't know what you want to do, like, uh, you know, go on a trip somewhere. People yeah. don't, people, people don't behave like Amazon does. You know, Amazon is a gigantic inhuman entity controlled by like shareholders who don't know each other and who basically like, you know, you have these types of like sort of inhuman scale structures that really are the sort of main powers in the global economy. And their agendas don't really match up to the agendas of ordinary people often. Sometimes they do, but not really. Right. And so a lot of human beings say like, you know what, I actually like the informal ability, for example, to use your example, you know, to like slightly speed up my like. Um, sort of, uh, you know, car Tire repair, but yeah, yeah by, by, by using the sort of informal kind of offline type of money. But at a structural level, the big powers that be, and this doesn't only include the state, it includes the big companies like to automate. Um, they hate that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> that represents a type of a part of the economy that can't be controlled. Well, correct. So, so to your point, though, I, and I, I, you're hitting at a chord, though. So it's not algorithmic. Which, to your point about automation, automation is mathematical by nature, okay? And when I show up and say, hey, here's a 50, cut me in line, that is random. That is, you know, decisive. That is human. And at the same time, it wouldn't fit the process and equation that's at hand for how most transactions would go on. Yeah. So, so like, if you want to look, see how, how the sort of cash the cash thing plays out. It's often what's going on is there's like um, different like parts of the equation. So, you know, in the US, it's sometimes kind of hard to tell because there's quite, still quite high cash usage in the US. But if you go to a Correct. place like the, U the UK, um, England, you know, like the cash system is basically imploded. All right. And what, what you'll see is ha what, what happens is that you'll, you, will, you will have an initial vanguard of people who basically do like automation. You know, it's often your yuppies, you know, the people that like hanging out with their MacBooks and stuff. And they kind of like to, they're sort of aspirational. So they, they like to sort of see themselves as cutting edge and stuff. And they often will uncritically accept um, the automation. It's like Silicon Valley people, right? They, they sort of have this sort of like uncritical acceptance of um, sort of techno-utopian automation, right? Those people exist, right? And also yeah. especially you find it among like younger people, partly because... Um, bear in mind, in each generation in an economy, younger people are always trying to differentiate themselves from older people, partly because they're going through all their sort of awkward identity formation processes. Agreed. Like te yep. Teenagers are always trying to like show that they're not their parents, right? So if you're a marketer at a company, this is your most vulnerable type of your population to target. And firms always target the target teenagers. This is a, it's one of the main ways main sort of wedges that you use to drive new technology, right? Because they often don't have the, the political awareness as well. And you can just sort of very quite easily kind of like push stuff into their sort of, um, and, you know, peer pressure will sort of force them to use Instagram and this kind of stuff, right? Exactly. Um, so you basically have those parts of the population that start to use the new thing and these kind of like people who perceive themselves as cutting edge. But what, what will start to happen is that um, maybe I'm trying to think of a metaphor. You know, imagine you're going down a river, right? And you're in a raft. It's like a white, you're like white water rafting, right? You might love the process of going down that river and be embracing that process. But in the end, the reason that the raft is going down the river is not because you wanted to. The reason it's going down is that the system, the river, is pulling it down, all right? In so far as your desire corresponds with the action of the raft, it's incidental, all right? So for example, the way I think about this is that there are structural forces at play in the global economy that are pulling, that are pushing cash out, right? Insofar as you happen to be a person who likes Apple Pay, well, good for you, right? Yeah. You happen to be going along with the grain of the system. But if you're not, the system's not gonna change course. If you're a person who says, I actually demand to use cash, the system doesn't care. The system will say, no, you can't. 
All right. So if I go to London right now and I look at, for example, a train ticket machine, yeah. um, quote unquote options that are available to me are all digital payments. There is no option to use cash, which basically means my demand to use cash is not going to be reflected in the market choice structure. All right? right. And the reason for that is that it goes against the grain of the system. All right. Whereas the digital ones don't go against the grain of the system. So this is what's happening to lots of people in places like London. Increasingly, you basically just forced, regardless of whether you want to use cash or not, right? And so all the sort of like sort of folklore and mythology that say the reason why this is happening is that ordinary people are choosing to move away from digital payments is very shallow. All right. What's actually happening is a kind of a structural process. So let me ask a let's ask a cost benefit question because I, I, I was thinking a lot about this during your book. So um, by the way, first off. I think the Oyster card system sucked too, just so we're all on the same page. Um, uh, so, so, uh, so, so let, let me ask you this. So, so there are, as you talk about in your book, there are incentives that like a credit card company to your point or Apple would have for me to go use Apple pay or tap my credit card to go into the London underground. Okay. Now let's say I was going to use cash. Okay. There are structural costs to cash that we might not pay attention to, but are present. In other words, I can give them money, but once the machine loads up with a bunch of cash, someone's got to draw that cash out. And so here in the United States, a company like Loomis would show up to collect all that cash with like former military people, former police, whatever they are. I think you, you touched on this a little bit, and particularly other countries, how they have to do this in more cash-filled societies. But there are costs to cash too, I guess my question is, which cost is greater? Is it greater to, to power data servers with electricity to store the information for the cashless transactions, or is it more expensive to have the armored vehicle pick up the cash and take it to its destination? Okay, well, there's a like a superficial way of answering this, and then a more like a more a more surface level way of answering okay. this. Okay, right. Well, for a start, the this, this this idea around the cost of cash is heavily debated. Okay. All right. So if you're an anti-cash person, you have a you will try to argue that cash is highly costly because of the infrastructure required to uphold the cash system. For example, those Loomis trucks and stuff and is relatively costly compared to, for example, the fixed costs of providing digital systems. Agree. Okay. All yeah. right. But like many things that cost a lot. There's often a reason for that, and often it's because they have better quality. You know, if I've got like high, you know, jeans that cost more than my polyester shirt, it's because yeah, it's a, the it's jeans, a normal the good. Jeans, yeah, it's, the jeans are better, right? So yeah. there's a reason why there's, it's useful to keep the cash system running, right? Because if you do not have the cash system running, fine, you might have the slightly lower fixed costs, arguably of the digital systems, but suddenly you unlock a ton of way more, way bigger sort of societal costs, right? Which I guess economists would sort of often euphemistically refer to as externalities, right? Um, basically you have, and this is where all the sort of negative sides of the, of the cash, cashless society comes out, right? And I can go through those from, you have like societal surveillance, now censorship, huge, resilience problems in your monetary system, like exclusion. But perhaps most profoundly, the actual digital money that we use, all right, and this is where having a knowledge of the monetary system starts to become important, the actual quote-unquote cashless systems themselves are both psychologically and legally dependent upon the cash system. Agree. All right. So this is where this becomes very like, complex because... Um, let's say you have some economist who comes in and says, okay, well, we've done a cost you know, benefit analysis and actually on net, the digital systems are cheaper, therefore get rid of the, the cash system. In so doing, they will undermine the cashless systems. All right, the two are tethered together. Let me interject because I, I, I agree with where you're going, but let me give you an example, okay? I have a fear. <laughs> Here's my fear, Brett. I am afraid I will forget how to write. Okay. Now, now here's why, because I know that the brain's activity is higher when you're using your hands and therefore can we have great writing if we don't have someone writing to your point? 
right? In other words, they're integrally tied to each other. The power of the hand and your thinking with your writing is actually superior to typing. And the question is, will we damage our thinking by typing? Sure, yeah. Well, look, if you want, you know, I think that's an interesting, an interesting example. And actually, there are sort of... Um, it's a, it's a, almost a paradox or a contradiction. I don't know which one. Yeah, I mean, just one, one sort of like side point to make about this, which is, you know, um, I don't want to go down this, this, this like rabbit hole necessarily, but um, a large part of digital ideology is, you know, if you, if you hang around in Silicon Valley, you see this all the time. There's this, this kind of like disgust to some extent of like the human body. All right. And, and like a lot of the sort of like sci-fi around this is, it sort of imagines like, you know, detached minds that sort of like exist in cyberspace. Singularity, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is basically just like a new formulation of like mind-body dualism, which has existed for a very long time, right? And, you know, mind-body dualism imagines there's like a fundamental separation between like the mind and the body and that somehow the mind is better often. Correct. That, which, was, which is how the Greeks viewed the world. They thought the mind was better. If you were a laborer, you were worse, etc. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's kind of like BS, but like it's very prevalent, right? Um, and if you ever look at like AI rhetoric, it's all about basically this. They sort of like hyper, they sort of like, you know, romanticize like the mind and then the perfect rational mind. And as you look at all, if you go and Google images and you type in AI, you see all these pictures of these like blue brained networks. So, you know, it's, it's always really weird, like space kind of like thinking, right? Yeah. Actual, <laughs> actual human beings are not like this. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and, and actual human beings are tactile. All right. A large part of our, um, our, our intelligence actually comes from our body, all right? Uh, it doesn't come from our mind. It comes from like feeling things and so on and emotions. And this is very unpopular if you, in sort of like tech circles or even in economist circles, you know, like, so, so the important point, you know, one of those, there's a big case we made, just the fact that the tactile nature of cash and these various things has important psychological effects, all right? You know, actually, if you, if you hang out, if you go into like uh, Visa's website, you know, Visa obviously benefits massively from a decline in cash usage um, because they, they coordinate the digital systems. You know, but B Visa actively uh, it has, a, has a website which calls the benefits of going cashless, where it tries to basically convince shops to stop accepting cash. And one of the reasons it gives is precisely that human beings basically spend a lot more with digital money, up to 20, 20 to 40% more. And there's a bunch of studies that actually show this, all right? And part of the reason is people have struggled to conceptualize what's happening when it becomes digital, right? Um, so you have these, in, in, in some ways, it accelerates spending processes, which is if you're a person who's trying to promote endless growth, maybe that's something you want. But from an actual individual human being's perspective, it's like how you become deeply indebted, all right, and this kind of stuff. So um, there's, a, there's a big, one of the big like, approaches I take when I'm looking at this issue of like cash versus digital money is to try and move away from the dualism, right? And to say like, you know what, many of our systems that we value in society actually have multiple or multimodal you know, for example, the transport system, you know, the mere fact that Uber happens to be convenient to you doesn't mean that you get rid of your bicycle system, for sure. example. You know, bicycles are technically slower and so on, right? And yet people love bicycles and they're actually incredibly efficient and convenient in many situations, right? So I've, the way I would talk about cash is like, it's like the public bicycle system of payments, right? I'm not going to use it for certain types of like, you know, international transfer or something. Yeah. But it's incredibly <laughs> useful and, and, and it keeps a balance of power in the monetary system. And this, this concept of a balance of power is extremely important to understand with money because when many people are thinking about, for example, the US dollar or you know, the pound, they imagine that it's a single currency, but it's not a single currency. It's an ecosystem of currencies that have the same name, right? Issued out in different layers by different players in different forms. Right, so the US dollar system has thousands of issuers. All right, the core issuers are the Federal Reserve and the Treasury. All right, but then there's a whole second layer of money issued out by the banking sector. And in the book, I'm using the sort of metaphor of digital casino chips. Sure. All right, basically, what those banks do is they will take in state money, all right, but issue out 
casino chips, basically digital casino chips, which is what you see in your bank account, right? So like your re your record of account, yeah. Yeah, your so-called cashless society is basically a society where you become dependent upon bank-issued digital casino chips, all right? And there's a third layer of players that plug into the bank system. So, for example, PayPal, it issues a third layer of money. All the so-called stablecoin systems right now are basically like plug into the banks, all right? Or at least a, a bunch of them do. Um, and so... You got you got to see the money system as having these multiple layers, and each layer is built upon the previous layer, right? And the sort of the most important politics, if you're interested in monetary politics, is between layer one and layer two, right? Because most people imagine that the state is in control of the, the money supply, but it's not really. The the money supply is largely controlled by the banking sector, right? The state, you know, via institutions like the Federal Reserve, have some ability to. Um, they can issue money, but largely it's the banking sector that issues most of the money via the process of extending loans, all right? And that's the sort of second form of money, which is these kind of digital casino chips. Um, well, Craig, and also, and also when you think of like the term shadow banking, that was excess capital being created out of credit outside of even the banks, but was still under the purview of the Federal Reserve. Yeah, and you could sort of think about the shadow banking sector as a kind of fourth layer of money. I mean, these, these, this is a stylized account I'm giving, yeah. um, but it's quite useful to think about money in layers like this, right? And some of the best thinkers of money, of money do think about it in layers. You know, like so, for example, so let me add, let me ask this question because you touched on it earlier, and I, I, I don't want to leave it too far. Uh, talking about credit cards and debit cards, can you explain the type? Like, what is the fee amount that's typically drawn on a transaction from a credit card? or a debit card. And like you pointed out, the UK is much more prevalent in digital payments. Um, what, what, what would you tell people are those fees as a percentage of transaction, let's just say? I mean, I don't actually know the specifics. It sort of shifts to different platforms in different countries, right? And it also depends on like how big your business is. And it's like, um, so offhand, I can't really tell you exactly what those are, but they can be like a number of percent, right? And there's the, the question is like, does your cash handling, if you're a small business owner, this is like a, of importance to you, right? To some extent, you're like, yeah. well, the credit card company takes a certain amount, but you know, having to get like, you know, deposit cash into the bank is also is this type of cost, right? Um, and you get widely different perspectives on which is the most costly, by uh, depending sure. on what type of business you're looking at. But I, I'm, I don't have all these different figures to hand right now. One of the important things, again, looking at that resilience question is that, let me give you a very crude example of this here to just okay. like illustrate this. I was, I was at a music festival in the UK recently um, where a, it was supposed to be a cashless festival, right? Um, they, they put a bunch of people into a field, um, all trying to use their mobile phones, like, you know, 10,000 people all trying to use their mobile <laughs> phones with the local, the local you know, uh, mobile phone uh, tower and stuff. And of course, it, sh it, it cut down the whole system. So all the, the, the cashless systems, which basically involve trying to uh, you know, communicate with the banking sector, um, failed. All right. The, the beer tent, which would have been making, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds, you know, per, you know, <laughs> per hour on, on this on, on stuff was turning away hundreds of people because it couldn't process their payments. Now, technically speaking, they might have said to me, well, you know, my, my cost of, you know, my card transactions was, you know, X, and, you know, but in reality, it was 100% was the cost in yeah. that situation, right? So if well, you're a business it, owner, contingency planning is very important, which is why many businesses actually have these multiple forms. But also many business owners actually fear that they're going to exclude customers if they start to uh, refuse cash, right? And so you'll notice that especially among working class populations and sort of poorer neighborhoods, people would never refuse cash, all right? Um, and this is why the whole kind of like vanguard of like cashlessness is often these kind of yuppie sort of like bougie places where basically they're able to exploit the fact that people, one, won't rebel and two, basically are bought into the big tech and big finance, right? Well, by the way, you're, you use the term bougie. It's one of my favorite terms. Uh, but to your point, I mean, I touched on this earlier. I think of like a bougie 32 year old single male or, or female in the UK who is, has no kids, has no responsibilities, what's going to happen this weekend, that's all I really care about, and that's like your perfect cashless consumer. Um, you know, it's not like they got to take kids to school or do anything outside of like, what am I going to do at my work and my home? 
And, but then as you add complications, like I think you talked a lot about when hurricanes come, what do people do? They go get cash quickly. It's like the old saying is like, there's no atheist in a foxhole. Um, there's also no cashless person in a hurricane. Yeah. If, if, you, if you want a quick rundown of all the basic like problems, it's quite, it's, I can, I can do it. You know, like the, the first, the first thing to like get in mind with this is to start to, th- to think about this balance of power question, right? Um, and because this, this basically enables you to understand all the problems of cashless society. All right. So and I'm, let's, let's use that bicycle versus Uber metaphor. All right. The typical digital ideology tells you that what cash is, is a horse cart. All right. And that what digital systems are is some, some kind of sports car. All right. Sure. And there's some kind of natural upgrade occurring. All right. Really, the way to think about it is that cash is a bicycle and the digital systems are like Uber. If you look at the difference between those two systems, one runs on public infrastructure, the other one runs on private infrastructure that's built on top of public infrastructure, mm-hmm. all right? One, you have autonomy, all right, with some limitations, you know, and the other one, you have dependence, okay? So you're dependent upon a third-party entity to get you somewhere, right? Sure. From, let's say, say Uber. Now, if those are in balance, they can both be positive, all right? This is what balance of power is about. It's about preventing the worst parts of different of a systems emerging by sort of balancing them off against each other, right? So if you're interested in creating a resilient system, you want balances of power because it sort of prevents negative stuff emerging. It's when you have a, a lack of that balance that it becomes a problem. So actually, if, if, for example, you live in a totally cash economy, it might actually be desirable to have digital systems come in because it'll sort of create some new res- forms of resilience in that system. But if mm-hmm. you totally get rid of cash, now you have the opposite problem. You've got new and dangerous forms of um, problems that emerge. And you can easily work these out through the simple thought experiment of imagining if Uber was the only way to, t- to move, right? Sure. You would have a massive centralization of power. You'd have colossal resilience problems in your society if that system goes down your entire ability to move that basically collapses well yeah you'd have, you have never-ending peak pricing <laughs> yeah you'd have huge exclusion problems all right if you can't access the system or if you don't want to access the system or if you pushed off the system you can basically be prevented from moving all right and you also have an attack on localization and this is one of the most things that's often not appreciated um you know, this kind of goes back to your point about the, your tire change. That thing you did there was a very localized interaction. Correct. If you And most digital systems involve centralization, right? You have to go via some distant entity to deal with somebody who's right in front of you, all right? So you basically every single local ch- interaction becomes a way of empowering some distant centralized entity, right? In this case, some whatever that entity is, right? And the, similar with these, these cash cashless systems, the digital systems, is basically... If you are forced into those systems and that's the only way you have to, to have you know, the only means of payment, you've got massive surveillance problems, you've got massive censorship problems, you've got massive resilience problems, you've got a huge attack on economic localization. Um, and these are the main sort of problems that emerge when you don't have that balance of power in place. All right. Um, so a large part of my book is I'm not saying, hey, you've got to constantly be using cash all the time. Sure. I'm saying you've got to maintain that balance of power, otherwise serious problems are going to emerge. The main problem, though, and this is, I'll quickly, I, don't want to, I won't go on too long about this, but going back to that thing I said earlier, the sort of like Marxist term, the contradictions of capitalism. One of the problems is that private firms, um, for example, the banking sector and Amazon, etc., they all have individual incentives to pursue automation, all right. Correct. Yeah, they can make a lot uh, of money from it. Yeah, no question. Exactly. They cut their costs. They can boost their revenues, etc. Which you know, you know, like a take market share investment cetera, model yeah. looks positive, right? So for them and their individual myopic perspectives, it makes sense for them to attack the cash infrastructure, close down ATMs, stop small businesses using the using you know branches. Say you have to use digital banking, etc. Right? It makes sense for them, and their basic job is to sort of convince people to do that. And if you're a bit slow, they kind of like try to like you know slowly wean you off or nudge you onto the <laughs> digital systems, right? Yeah. And that's what they all do. Um, and because they all move in that same direction, they feel emboldened. They don't feel like they're actually going against something. They all be like, well, you know, all the other companies are doing it, so we also feel entitled to do this as well. All right. Um, 
But what they do in the process is they undermine that balance of power, all right, which if you go back to my structural description of money, which has these layers, with each layer built on top of the other layer, you'll see that the digital layer, all right, is these sort of digital casino chips issued up by banks, all right? And if you know anything about a casino chip, you'll know that if you remove the ability to redeem that casino chip for cash, right, the casino chip ceases to have any meaning, right? So if I go into a casino and you know, I hand over cash and they give me those chips and then I come back later in the night and say, can I have my cash back? And they say, you know what? No, I just keep the chip. I'm going to start to have serious doubts about what that chip is, okay? So actually, legally and sort of psychologically, the digital units are predicated upon people believing they can be redeemed back for state money. Now, when you have all these individual firms who are slowly undermining that ability to do that, it actually ends up screwing them over, right? Because the very basis of the sort of stability of the financial sector is partly predicated upon the public believing in the, the second tier money. And this is the reason right now why there's a bunch of debates emerging about the so-called central bank digital currency, which is basically the central banks have worked out that there's a huge structural problem emerging in the monetary system because of the decline in the cash system. And they're having to now experiment with issuing a kind of new form of layer one digital money, um, which is causing a bunch of consternation because the banking sector does not want the state to compete with it sure. via well, a new form of digital money. Well, uh, let me add one more thing on this because I think you're, I think you do a good job of this throughout the book where what works in the UK doesn't necessarily work in India, doesn't ne necessarily work in Bangladesh. So I, I grew up in Seattle, okay? I was born and raised in Seattle. And in downtown Seattle, they had this idea that because Europe widely adopted, you know, bike lanes, that Seattle should too. OK. Um, and so they did. They took a lot of the downtown city streets, put in bike lanes, got rid of roads. OK. Now, to your point, it be made the system more dependent on bike lanes. Now, here's the great irony to this, quote unquote, deemed transition. Call it a carless society, kind of like a cashless society. Right. What ended up happening is no one goes to downtown. It's a ghost town now. <laughs> so in other words, we did all this work to make it carless. And there's no use. <laughs> so to your point, does the model that we're pushing cashless, is it, 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 you know, this local aspect that you talked about is so important to the transactional nature of our economies? Yeah, I mean, look, I would, in my metaphor, I'm using bicycles to refer to cash, right? So Correct. Because if you want to, if you, if, you, if you care, because remember the balance of power thing, right? If you have an all cash economy, you have problems. If you have an all digital economy, you have problems. Correct. Right. So you, the, interest, the, 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 the interesting thing is to try and create the balance, right? So you're now pointing to sort of the opposite extreme. Like you somehow destroyed the entire like motor industry or something. Which Correct. Know, but, 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 seems no, implausible, but like it's, it's a possibility, yeah. right? Well, it's a possibility, but here's because to your point about diversification, this applies to other like analogous things. So for example... Um, you, and you touched on, I think, I think you almost touched on this and I, I'd love to ask you this question. Can a, let's use your yuppie cause your yuppie is a good picture. Okay. That yuppie believes in a cashless society at the same time that yuppie believes that carbon is terrible. Aren't those antithetical statements? They, they actually have a huge logical disconnect, don't they? I mean, people are always contradictory, right? I mean, not all yuppies think that. There's lots of like right wing yuppies. There's an embarrassment. Not, not, not in the UK. <laughs> I mean, they're not even really left wing. I mean, they're kind of like sort of centrist liberals, right? Yeah. So yeah. They're, they're not like Marxists. They're, yeah, I agree. They're kind of like center, center left, right? Which is what in the, the US you'd call a liberal. Um, so, I mean, there's an interesting thing going on politically, like, with my position as left wing, straightforward, yep. right? Yeah, very obvious. Now, yep. interestingly though, there's a very strong conservative support for pro cash stuff. So actually, a lot of my work has a cross, a cross um, political ideal. Um, actually, like tomorrow morning, I'm supposed to be going onto like GB News, which is one of the most right wing like. Um, uh, 
news stations in the UK, right? Mm -hmm. It would be considered part of the new populist right, right? And what's interesting that there's been these types of reshufflings going on in sort of political ideologies, right? Where a lot of like topsy-turvy stuff is happening, right? And so um, a lot of kind of your sort of urban middle class, right, who are often on the sort of vanguard of technology tend to be sort of like centrist liberals, right, to some extent. Sure. Um, not talking about like Peter Thiel, right, who's like massively right wing. Yeah. Right? But he's he's part of the Silicon Valley establishment who like is very pro digital payments. Right. So like, like very, very and very libertarian to your point. In other words, uh, there's this kind of big lie in tech that we're libertarian. We don't need the government. But again, if someone reads your book and thinks about the power structures and the incentives, no, no, they're very beholden to the government. In fact, they like the government system because it's a power structure that works for them. Isn't that I mean, fair? the whole of Silicon Valley is built upon government funding. I mean, it's basically like part of the military industrial complex, right? And that's always been the history of Silicon Valley. But they would but never admit just, that, just, though. It's no, all their own not. It's not, it's not part of the ideology, of course. You know, that's it's inconvenient, right? So, well, yeah, um, I agree. And, you know, but, but de, de facto, like all the, all the research that gave rise to technologies comes from like, you know, like radar research for like military stuff and exactly. you know, all, that, all, that, all that kind of thing, right? So the reality, this is quite standard in most capitalist systems, is that the state and the market operate in sort of complex uh, symbiosis, all right? I come from a more like anarchist way of thinking of the world, which is, um, which also partly comes from anthropology, right? Which is that in sort of standard, you know, like old school 1980s thinking, they try to make this distinction between the state and the market. Um, but it's largely like an illusion, right? The states and markets operate in very complex interrelationships with each other and they often can't exist apart from each other at least at the large scale i agree um, well, I, so I, silicon I, valley has all the has all this like complexity a lot of these like guys who claim to be libertarians in silicon valley are basically more than happy to work for the state when they can well that's pa that's palantir it. you you did a good job in your book explaining palantir it's government funded they bought the equity they got the client i mean it's it's all government funded this so is why but politically, when you're looking at the cash system, it's quite complex because actually there is a lot of sort of, uh, let's say, people from more humbler parts of, of, of the economy who at, at some points might be considered, you know, quote unquote, left wing, depending on the situation, or at other points become what's called right wing, depending on the situation, right? Sure. Um, I don't like to sort of label people as being somehow having a, an essence a political essence. Often what people have is like a situation that they try to respond to with by taking on a particular ideology. Sure. All right. And what's been happening recently is that lots of people who are actually quite sort of historically more on the left have been sort of drawn more into the kind of populist right, right? And so in my cash work, I would, I see a lot of that happening. You have lots of people who are basically don't like big tech and big finance and stuff, right? But have kind of now taking on lots of the sort of more like conspiracy way of thinking. And they're like, taking in lots of the memes that follow up, go around the sort of right. And so actually a lot of people who are, you know, pro cash of, of, of sort of taking that on. And that's, I got to work with that. Right. Um, interestingly, what's been happening recently, if you're interested in this debate as a sort of the sort of updated version is that because many governments now are being pushed towards experimenting with CBDC, the traditional political right has suddenly got a new kind of, uh, kind of vigor towards being pro cash because they suddenly see this possible for possibility for a state version of digital money. All right. Um, whereas the historical thing we refer to as cashless society is actually a private sector. Correct. Outcome. All right. Yeah. So there's an interesting buy for like, like, like a weird mixing going on right now. So like if I go to London and I, and I see these, there's lots of these sort of like pamphlets you find being left around by people, people who are concerned about cashless society because they can't use cash. And so, they'll see these pamphlets that have been put out, which says, hey, a lot of the, it says lots of the stuff that I say, right? Hey, this is a big problem. It's like, it's dangerous and so on. But then it will have a, a, a link to a website that tells you that the world's run by like um, a cabal of Illuminati and stuff like that, <laughs> right? And, yeah. and that's what's happening though. The, the conspiracy opportunists are very, very good at exploiting public fears, right? Yeah. Without giving very co co like coherent structural accounts of what's actually occurring, which is what, okay. you know, again, this is, this is, this is politics. <laughs> well, and, well, and, and so, back, because I, I think it's really interesting. Like, I, I think you're striking at an incredible, incredible thought in your book. Cause I walked away asking myself back to the yuppie. It's like, okay, the yuppie wants to go cashless. 
But as you point out so well in your book, that cashless society is effectively a massive accounting ledger, you know, recording the credits and the debits of the system overall that's ultimately fed in the dollar system to the Fed. And what that is stored with is it sits out on servers, as you very well pointed out, that are heavily guarded, might I add. Um, but what powers those servers are energy. And the most readily abundant form of energy in the world is carbon-based. So the person wanting to go cashless is actually like a carbon bull, and they might be really worried about climate change at the same time. And it, it almost seems like it's, you know, it's... Uh, it, 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 it's not paradoxical. It comes off as though it's ironic, doesn't it? Sure. Yeah. But again, bear in mind, people have compartments in their brain that have different ways of processing different information. Sure. So, and this is why the same types of like cognitive dissonance occur all over the political spectrum. Right. Um, so it's not particularly surprising. Um, and there's often different sources of those sort of belief systems. Sure. So l let me ask you a question on the card side, because I, I think this debate, it hits at exactly what you're getting at. So I, want, I don't know if you've seen this, but I want to mention it. So are, are you aware of what Bill Ackman's been doing with Visa and MasterCard uh, here in the recent like year where he's out funding a lawsuit against Visa and MasterCard for taking payments uh, for, you know, porn websites? So like Pornhub, for example, and because he's arguing that they are exploiting women and they're profiting from the exploitation of women. And I found this like an interesting case study in reading your book, because on one hand, I could argue that I could see how people could be censored or sur survey like this is surveillance because ultimately the government could come in and say, I can see the transactions you're doing on your credit card. At the same time, on the other side of the coin is this exploitation of women that Ackman's pushing against. And it's interesting also because like Visa and MasterCard are involved, but Am American Express will not take payment for that. So how do you look at something like that where, you know, to your point, it's a very sensitive subject. There's obviously people that are going to have views on both sides. How, how would you fall on a subject like that where there's this surveillance and yet at the same time humanitarian issue? Yeah, I mean, like, again, most things in society have these types of like contradictory elements to them, right? And this is partly why the balance of power arguments are important. Um, how do I fall on that question? I mean, I personally don't have a particular, I'm not like a massive porn fan, but like I, I'm not like sanctimonious or like moralistic about it. Sure. Right? It's not my um, thing that causes me the most like, you know, consternation in society. Yeah, you don't, you don't wake up middle of the night worrying about it. Yeah. If you're a person, for example, where that's the thing that you really like exercises you, then of course you could try to apply pressure to the monetary system or the payments process to try and stop that thing. And historically, people from all over the political spectrum could try to do this. You know, this doesn't only apply to payments. It applies to like divestment campaigns of all sorts. Sure. There's lots of like moral groups you know, that will try to sort of stop companies buying to, uh, tobacco companies, people buying shares of tobacco companies, or if you're more kind of like environmentalists to stop people buying fossil fuel companies. You know, the same principle applies. You can basically use these large scale structures to try and strategically like cut off flows of capital to particular parts of the world that you don't like. Sure. Um, and that's a kind of debate that's like part of normal politics, right? Um, and so... On the porn one, I don't have a particular. I'm, I'm not running. You don't got a dog campaign. in the fight. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me. So yeah, let me yeah, ask but but, but it's but it's like part of part of the part of the question is like, um, and again, this is tricky, right? In society, like, the reason why big monoculture digital systems are a real threat is that most most societies, what what we call like at least social progress depends on there being a zone of deviance, right? A gray zone, all right? So for example, let's take South Africa, where I'm from, right? There was a time when, for example, like interracial marriage was technically illegal, all right? So if you were having an interracial relationship, you're thrown in prison. Now, from my perspective, that's not a very like, that's a pretty damn like um massive case of overreach on the part of like a moralistic racist government sure right so in that case the legal system does not represent my morality 
Okay, so you know, in many cases, people have legitimate reasons to stand against what is technically legal, right? But if you have these huge digital systems, what you tend to have is a kind of like these black and white, right? You suddenly have this power to monitor, at least you have a far greater power to monitor whether the current version of morality as encoded in the legal system is being followed, right? And to sort of stamp out all that gray area stuff. But if you think about what's happening, you know, historically, large part of what we, what we call progress entails legalizing parts of those gray zones, right? This is kind of a long, long and turgid way of saying you want to keep a degree of like informality in your society. You don't want everything to be running through giant formal systems, sure, right? Because if, the, if you end up being on the wrong side of the people running the formal systems. And that could both be, you know, a kind of like right wing dictatorship or a sort of left wing dictatorship, depending on, you know, what your vision of a nightmare is. You basically don't want any of those parties to have that ability, right? Um, and this is why this whole balance of power stuff is important. Well, it makes me think of like Napster as an example, right? Napster was a deviance in the market in the early 2000s, right? It was effectively handing out free music via the internet. And to your point, that deviance was allowed for a season, then was prosecuted and put to bed. But interestingly, the deviance did cause people to ask the question, what if I could get my music from the internet? And today, we do, right? So to your point, that deviance had its path and had its ending. So let me ask you another question, because again, this gets into the incentives, structures, power structures, government, private sector, et cetera. How do you look at something like Section 230 then, right? Um, you know, which effectively takes all the liability off of the hosting businesses or any business hosting internet content and pushes that, you know, away from them. In other words, the government's saying you're not liable. It, it, it's putting the government in, in, in them together, in effect. How do you look at something like that in this power structure? I don't have enough knowledge of that to have a particularly like coherent opinion, like give me some more detail. Well, section 230, it, it, it's, it's a law that was written years ago to your point earlier, where it would, it protected internet businesses from the content posted on their websites. Now, why? Because back then the government wanted the internet to proliferate to your point. It was in the U S best interest. It, it was in, in many people's best interest, but the government could get information out to people a lot quicker by, uh, you know, reducing the cost of proliferating data. OK, now, as I we talked about, like, say, porn, for example, there are a lot of externalities to a rule like that, which is that now someone has a lot of power, a lot of cash and not a lot of liability. Is that to your point on kind of the discussion of cash versus non-cash? Is that the balance that's needed in society? And and I, I mean, even though, like you pointed out, like, you, you know, you, you consider yourself a Marxist on some level. I mean, to be completely fair, Brett, I consider myself like your classic right wing evangelical Christian. And yet I would agree with you that the balance of power is out of whack, which is to your point earlier about this idea where you're finding people on the left and the right agreeing. Yeah. I mean, look, people are always going to disagree because the world is contradictory. And basically, at some level, everybody's right and wrong. Right. So, and that's a kind of a hard point to maybe like convey, but at some level, I'm, I'm not just like a Marxist. I'm probably, I probably have quite strong sort of like Buddhist types of principles or existentialist kind of principles, which is basically like the world is fundamentally contradictory. Sure. As a default well, starting point. Yeah. All right. Now in a, in a lot of, in a lot of Western philosophy, that's sort of kind of like people that weirds people out they don't quite know how to, how to how to deal with that they're like well that's either one thing or something else isn't it and it's like no the it's fundamental great. reality of the world is contradictory now if you really believe that right you might have political ideologies but you also prepared to under, you understand that they don't represent the whole and everlasting truth of everything all right now in our current sort of like state of debate and politics you're kind of like um, disincentivized from having any kind of nuance or like contradiction in your thinking, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's how I see reality. 
right? And so I come from a Christian background and stuff. I'm not a Christian now, but like I'm, I come from a Christian background, right? I understand the dynamics of like Christianity. I understand sure. the dynamics of conservatism and stuff, but I could, so I could, I could understand in certain certain positions, those things make sense, right? And it's, sometimes it's useful to, to, to have that. Um, and what I'm interested in when you're looking at sort of like systems level stuff is again, like how do you enable human beings to be like contradictory human beings Right, um, and that's, that sounds like, um, and a lot of that entails basically creating these types of balances of power and not attempting to try and create um, final kind of like states of being. Now, if you think about, for example, like Silicon Valley ideology, a lot of it's about creating, if you like, sort of a, a singularity thinking. All right, it's like, like Ray Kurzweil, we, for example. We will all become a gigantic kind of like super intelligence that will somehow like transcend all boundaries. I mean, it's total BS, right? It's like a, it's like well, a. And so California I- is the, the model for the world. Yeah, it's an unhinged ideology. All right, and it will very quickly butt up against the reality of of humanity, which is that we are not, um, sort of like digital gods existing in a cloud where are like physical beings that walk around the streets. I agree. Well, not only, not only physical beings, but to our discussion just a second ago, we're physical beings that are spiritual, which is what the technology can't ever be, which is part of its problem. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to quote a line from your book because I, this is touching right at what you're getting at. I mean, this is just perfect. The dollar or cash allows for humanity, uh, quote, the notes roam without concern for what neighborhood they find themselves in. They can re- be rolled up to snort cocaine in a fashionist soiree or be, u- be used to buy nappies in a corner store. The note is non-judgmental, a kind of every man serving rich and poor alike. For anyone who distrusts institutions that do not automatically protect them, cash offers some breathing room, end quote. Now, I'm teasing when I say this, but were you speaking from experience on all these things? <laughs> I, I mean, I'm personally not really a cocaine fan, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm like, uh, to some extent, yes. Um, I'm also, I'm not very sanctimonious about, I'm not very like moralistic about most things in society. Right. Um, interestingly, if you want to like get real about this in the sort of public debate, I mean, a lot of the anti-cash people who, you know, a lot of sort of the typical kind of like sort of, you know, innovation journalist or whoever it is that sort of has taken it on. Those people love to have the ability to use cash to buy illegal substances. Correct. Correct. They work great in in black markets and gray markets. Yeah. They basically, people like black markets, right? And you can be as moralistic as you want about it, but it's a reality. You can try to stamp out black markets, but they'll just spring up somewhere else. For example, they're springing up heavily with the crypto systems, right? So a a lot of these types of like ideas, it's sort of the ideological ideas are often sort of like out of touched with not only the reality of human society, but the reality of the very people who channel them. All right. So, and that's a kind of like a subtle point. A lot of people who claim to believe in digital ideology, often when you watch them and how they actually act, they don't. All right. They actually like a lot of non-automated stuff and they rely upon a lot of non-automated stuff, but they happen to have some kind of incentive or some kind of like a way of thinking about things that, that cause them to romanticize um, sort of the digital world. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not, uh, there's definitely a bunch of like gray activity that occurs with the cash system, just like with any systems, like the, the digital systems as well. Um, and I'm not, I'm not out there to be like, I don't believe that society should try to eradicate all of that. You can try to minimize that, right? But you never sure. want to try to eradicate that because when you try to eradicate um, all forms of deviance, it's basically like, you know, you know, you, you try to get rid of some kind of like bacteria in your stomach by, you know, dropping some, you know, trying to nuke it with some very powerful antibiotic. And then you like destroy all the positive bacteria in your stomach as well. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a, it's it's Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and an opposite reaction. To your point. Yeah, and to finish that metaphor, actually, the toxic bacteria then just mutates into a new form. So you not you don't even achieve what you're trying to achieve. All right, and this is what the kind of stuff you know I often come across these people. You know, I once for example, in like an FBI agent, 
um, in Italy was going on this big like rant to me about like how the scum in society use cash, right? Um, and in his vision, like, you know, um, digital systems it could be like a kind of like cleansing agent to clean the scum out of society. Well, because he has no sin, obviously. He, he's sinless, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's basically you know, like it's like a fascist viewpoint, right? But like, he, you know, he, it's, it's, it's not only is it, is it wrong, but it wouldn't even work. Right. And this uh, is this is it's- let's pick up on that, because you, you're I think you do a really good job explaining that this is different in different hands and different governmental hands. Um, h- how do you see a cashless society in America versus your view of a cashless society in, say, China? Well, that's a big question. I mean, like the you I mean, in terms of how it would play out. Yeah, in other words, like what you know, what would be the government's interest in China that's different than the government's interest in in the U.S.? Well, I mean, you've got fundamentally like different political structures in these countries, right? Like, um, you know, both China and the U.S. are part of the, of the two biggest players in the global capitalist system. All right. One of them happens to have a much more centralized structure, right, that has much more direct control over its corporations. And the other tries to sort of like pretend that it doesn't like it's a sort of a separation between the corporations and the state. Right. But in reality, the U.S. is constantly like promoting its corporations overseas constantly. Right. Sure. So, so both both of them are like locked in a kind of like kind of great power sort of struggle with strategically involves the state trying to promote the corporate interests at some level. Right. But do you, do you look at surveillance and censorship the same way in each country? No, no. So what I'm saying is there's different they're part of the same overall structure. Right. I'm not like a I'm not like a kind of. Um, bog standard sort of libertarian that sort of somehow imagines the U.S. as a free country, or not, not that libertarians necessarily do that, but sort of like romanticize the U.S. somehow, and then look at look at China as somehow being the sort of epitome of like everything that's wrong with the world. They're mm-hmm. part of the same structure overall, right? One has much higher levels of centralization, at least explicit centralization, um, but then again, the sort of morality or the population in China is very different as well. All right. So there'll be much higher levels of surveillance in China. The de facto are much higher levels of surveillance in China. Um, but you, if you go to China and you sort of like poll people, they don't, they don't respond in the way you think they're going to respond. Right. There is be a certain sort of emergent um, kind of progressive part of the middle class that does have values similar to the U.S. Perhaps there's mm-hmm. whole sections of China that basically say, OK, it's fine. Right. The government's kind of like a daddy that sort of like helps us progress in the world. Right. Um, And so that's the situation right now. I think going forward in China, there's going to probably be an emergence over time of a kind of like democracy movement. But right now, there's very heavy like state intervention. So they won't even admit Tiananmen Square. I mean, like you can't if you, you can't even find it. No, of course. And so, yes, any kind of new digital technology offers new vectors of power for for the current um a government in play, right, in, in China. And this is one of the big concerns about digital technology more generally, is that historically with states, states are like, you know, kind of, to some extent, they're constituted by the people that make them up, all right? Or um, allow them. Yeah, I mean, so, so one, of the, one of the problems in like sort of very, let's say, crude libertarian thinking is that the sort of state is imagined almost like an alien invader that comes out of space and sort of enslaves you, all right? And it's imagined but, that it has- But a, you vote for him every year. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but you so sort of imagine that it has an external power source. Like it's getting, it's getting its power source from its home planet somewhere and then it's using that to like <laughs> enslave you, all right? In reality, the state's power source is you, all right? And so there's a, there's a structure that you're part of and you don't perceive yourself to necessarily have power within it. But of course, the politicians themselves often don't perceive themselves to have absolute power either, right? There's a, there's a big sort of structural process going on, right? And so to some extent, and you know, even p- people like Machiavelli in their sort of writing about states note this to, to the, 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 in the book, like The Prince. It's like, you know, you have power, but you don't have that much power. All right. Sure. Don't like it, overplay your power because then your base will turn on you and like remove your power. We could find out if Putin's doing that right now, for example. Yeah, ex- exactly. Right. And so, so the, but, you know, the question, and that's historically the case. You sort of believe that like to some extent, even with authoritarian systems, 
there are these sort of processes going on where there still has to be some degree of accountability going on. And one of the big concerns with digital, the proliferation of digital tech more generally is whether sort of rulers who happen to find themselves at the top of a kind of pyramid structure get new and ver far more powerful tools to maintain that position, which they didn't have in the time of Machiavelli. All right. Well, to your, to your point, I mean, like, how, how is, I mean, think of these Bitcoin transactions that the FBI or the U.S. government are able to track now that they weren't three years ago or four years ago or five years ago. Yeah, yeah, sure. Lots of the, you know, and this thing you know, goes back to the whole kind of like connection between state and market. And in reality, if you look at a country like the U.S., uh, all the big tech firms and stuff, um, benefit hugely from the sort of underlying structure of like the U.S. and its military and stuff, right? And where and the U.S. government simultaneously benefits hugely from some of the new technologies that the tech firms are building. Agree. Right? So, Agree. And a lot of those and a lot of those technologies are pushed forward not because there's some overt agenda on the part of the tech company to like enslave you. It's because they make profit, right, by kind of exploiting your short-term interest to the detriment of your long-term interest. So they'd be like, oh, well, you can save a little bit of time with this thing here. And then you sort of become, as you sort of adopt that, and especially if you're in like a frenetic society, you're very prone to sort of adopting these sort of short-term solutions. But as you do that, they ratchet up the level of dependence in the systems. Now you basically can't operate unless you use these systems. And once that happens, you then have this ability, for, ex for example, states to then exploit that, right? Um, so all right now, all the frontiers like smart homes and smart cities and like quantified self where you got like, you know, little wrist Fitbits and stuff, all of these are basically new forms of like um, digital technology reaching into the smallest parts of your life. And once you become dependent upon structures like that, for example, imagine an insurance company says, you know what, we're going to up your insurance premiums unless you wear a Fitbit to give us data. You know, <laughs> it's such a pain to use those apps. I totally agree with you. It's it just my, my mind blows. So because also you talk about like some of the tech libertarians, like the ideas of seasteading and kind of building your own civilization um, as though the U.S. government's going to let you go out into their sea waters and, you know, let you put your island up, which you give an example in the book where someone tried to do that and that got shut down pretty quickly. Let me let me because um, as you could probably tell. I, I could go on for hours on this because I think it's an incredibly fun debate, an incredibly awesome dialogue for thinking about, like to our discussion earlier, it is human. Um, we're not algorithmic. We, we don't think of ourselves perfectly a, a, as we are, um, and yet we're spiritual at the same time, which is an oddity in and of itself. So, you know, uh, from your book, what, what, is there anything else that we haven't discussed that you do think should be mentioned to our listeners? Maybe in just very um, uh, brief terms, part of what the book is doing is to try and prevent a more dystopian version of our system emerging, right? Gotcha. So I have, I have an, an inherently sort of critical view of these sort of large scale corporate capitalism, right? Um, but, and I'm not like romantic about sort of cash, for example, I don't, presume that somehow it's all like holy and so on right what i'm interested in is saying look this is the system we have uh, how do we prevent a worse version of it emerging all right sure. and part of that involves protecting these balances of power saying you know what like protect the cash system it's important for our humanity right um but it doesn't necessarily have an idealistic part to the book i'm not sort of like being like oh i have some utopian plan for how to make society like ideal or something right agree agree um, and so, um, but, but one thing, if, if I was to channel some of my more idealistic side, um, which is maybe for a different book at some other time, um, I'd say one of the things I'm particularly interested in is, you know, the realm of alternative currency. And in the book, I do look at things like Bitcoin and the sort of crypto movements, but I'm very skeptical about um, Bitcoin for various reasons. What Bitcoin sort of tried to do is to sort of set itself up as a kind of antithesis to the existing system, right? And in broad terms, the two key features of our multi-layered money system is that it's hierarchical, um, we might say centralized to some extent, 
Sure. And it's also dynamic. It expands and it contracts. All right. And if you look at Bitcoin, it sort of set itself up to attack both of those. Say, we're going to try to create some kind of uh, non-hierarchical decentralized system, but it's also going to be static. It's not going to have an expansion and contraction. It's not going to pulsate. It's this very sort of static view of money. All right. Um, you know, this is very like a hard limit on the number of units. And it's very, it's almost, it's quite like puritanical actually, right? It's got this sort of very sort of like austere way of thinking about the world. And it's sort of set up as an apparent sort of antithesis to the normal monetary system. In reality, what's happened with Bitcoin is it's sort of been just kind of absorbed into the standard system as an object to be traded like any other, right? Um, and I'm actually interested in the realm of like, experimentation with money about how you sort of hybridize elements from both of those systems so to say like okay can we have um alternative currency that's moves away from the static vision of bitcoin the kind of hard money way of thinking but maintains the sort of decentralization aspect sure. right. so so sort of more horizontal kind of like credit systems with people issuing ious and stuff and so my more idealistic side works on that kind of stuff to say you know um and then i'll have a piece coming about out about that soon um and i think it's quite interesting i'm so i'm i'm i would encourage people to sort of get involved in sort of thinking about alternative currency but i'd sort of also like warn them against getting um maybe captured by the Bitcoin narrative, which has been quite sort of hegemonic in the alternative currency space. There's a lot more interesting things happening. To your point, there's a framework issue. And I, I, and that, that's, I think that's one of the better part of your books is, your book is that you explain the, the, just the pure framework shortcoming. Um, and, and by the way, your use of the word puritanical, I find very interesting because our dollar bill was created by Puritan Massachusetts to effectively step away from the coinage rules of the King of England at the time. Drawer was speaking about that. So, yeah, so I, I find that to be interesting. Um, I, this has been just a fabulous conversation, Brett. I've, I've totally enjoyed it. I was going to ask you, where can our listeners follow you going forward? I have a newsletter, um, which is a brettscott.substack.com. Um, the title of the newsletter is Altered States of Monetary Consciousness. Um, so I basically use that to sort of, it's a kind of a, you know, a, a kind of quite fun, but focused newsletter on thinking differently about money. Sure. Right? And, and so um, it has some quite big pieces on there where I help people sort of understand CBDC or understand, you know, cash of society and stuff like that. And I put out pieces from time to time, but sort of a quite, quite irregularly. But when I put them out, they're quite big and, and sort of well, um, uh, quite deep pieces. Um, so that's uh, uh, worth, worth um, following. I mean, I'm also on Twitter. Twitter's become pretty, I feel like it's gone downhill. <laughs> what, 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 what's your Twitter handle? Uh, it's called a suit possum. It's a bit of a, it's a long story behind that name, but, um, <laughs> nice. S U I T P O S S U M. Awesome. Um, but yeah, I'm, I am on there and I, I do try to respond to stuff. Brett, this has been a, this has been an absolute pleasure. Um, for our podcast listeners, go buy a copy of Brett's book, cloud money to think about the players and our current financial system and what their incentives are. Brett's book will teach you a lot also about other systems outside the United States by his experiences and people he's met. Um, and he might even teach you who the bad actors may be. Um, if you've enjoyed our discussion with Brett, go to Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Give us a review, rating, a recommendation for other podcast listeners. Uh, for our existing listeners, if you have a great book that you'd like to recommend, email podcast at smeetcap.com. That's podcast at smeetcap.com. You can also send suggestions to us at Twitter uh, on our handle at smeetcap. Thank you for joining us for a Book With Legs podcast. We look forward to the next episode. Thank you for listening to A Book With Legs, a podcast brought to you by Smead Capital Management. The material provided in this podcast is for informational use only and should not be construed as investment advice. You can learn more about Smead Capital Management and its products at smeadcap.com or by calling your financial advisor.